Seth Moulton, Massachusetts congressman, presidential candidate. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's an honor to be here. So, you know, on my way over here, I was thinking there's some commonalities between the nuclear industry and politics in general. And the thing that I was thinking about was that people respond more to how you act than what you say. And, you know, when it comes to finding a new leader, like America wants someone who's strong and confident. And you've got a lot to be confident about. Harvard physics degree, four tour of duty, badass Marine, Harvard MBA. Now, Congressman, you're killing it. Well, first of all, I think doing any of those things was fundamentally a humbling experience for me at first. Um, you know, Harvard physics department was tough. A lot of smart kids from all over the country. Yeah. Uh, joining the Marines was the first time that I was really challenged on important but different things that I had never been tested on before, like what it actually means to, to embody leadership, to study leadership, to be tested on leadership. And when you and, say leadership uh, as a Marine, I mean, you were in active combat too. You weren't just some guy doing strategy somewhere behind a desk in America. You were actually out there. You know, I didn't have any military background, but uh, the most important mentor I've ever had in life was actually the minister at Harvard who mm. talked a lot about the importance of service, mm. about how you should find a way to give back yourself. And so I looked at different options, but I had so much respect for these 18-year-old kids who serve on the front lines, yeah. uh, many of whose names are on the walls at places like Harvard because they gave their lives for us, that I decided that that's where I wanted to do my part. I wanted to be on the front lines in the infantry. And so I signed up for the Marines. But that wasn't scary for you? I mean, you... Was it scary? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, look, courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is doing the right thing in spite of your fears. And that's one of the things the Marine Corps teaches you. Uh, what I did in the Marines was frightening. But I was proud to do it so, uh, so no one had to go in my place. By the way, my first physics exam at Harvard was frightening too. <laughs> <laughs> I think the average was in the 40s or something. So, I mean, it is, you, it is interesting that you've got, this, um, you've got this science background. You're able to understand issues on a more, I would say, fundamental, practical, pragmatic, analytically driven basis. Um, and then this like, real life experience. I just find it so interesting. That, I mean, that's why I brought up at the start of the show. It's like this confluence of two things. I mean, that's really, people are going to be looking for something that really sets people apart. And I do feel that intersection really does set you apart. You're probably able to look at issues very differently than some of your colleagues are able to because of this mix of experiences. Well, I think the two of the core elements here are really important to making the right decisions for our country and for our future. One is that we have to believe in science. And we all know the stories of people in Congress, people in Washington who don't, who literally ignore the facts every day. I think. Americans want fact-based decision-making, you know, evidence-based decision-making. So I had an idea actually about um, bills that I want to run by you. I don't always get this opportunity. How come um, when we write a law, how come it's prescriptive instead of outcome-based? How come we don't just decide what we want to happen and then not actually prescribe the way to implement it? Almost like you would with a science experiment. You say, hey, we can all agree, you know, we've got certain core values as Americans. We agree we want people to be risen out of poverty. We agree, you know, these things. So let's write the law that way and give people different flexibility. Hey, you try it here, you try it there. Um, we're going to base uh, how this law performs based on uh, predetermined criteria. And then two years, we're going to evaluate it. If it's good, it actually goes into full law. If it doesn't, you know, it just gets erased. Has anyone ever pushed something forward like that? Never seen it. I think that gets to the second core element of maybe my experience here, which is the leadership piece. Mm -hmm. So you can have the right ideas and they can be based on facts and science, but getting things done requires leadership. And I think that Congress is mostly made up of, I mean, with all due respect to lawyers, there are a lot of lawyers here. You know, they're used to writing very prescriptive laws saying this is how you can do things. And, and if you don't do it this way, here are all the different ways you can get in trouble uh, versus really thinking outside the box and encouraging Americans to, uh, to innovate. So there, to be fair, I mean, there are laws, um, programs that we start in Congress that do encourage innovation. For example, there are competitive grant programs 
Now, competitive grant programs are kind of an example of what you're talking about, where we say, hey, we want a certain outcome in education. We're not going to tell you exactly how to get there, mm -hmm. but you can present different models to us. We'll evaluate them, and then we'll award the grants to the ones that we think are best. I think those types of laws generally are more successful than the ones that just say, okay, you know, because we're so smart here in Washington, everybody knows it, you know, we're just going to figure this out for everybody else and tell them exactly what to do. So what are some of the areas right now that you're focused on? What do you care about? So my biggest focus is how the economy is changing so quickly, because I think it's the reason yeah. why a lot of Americans are feeling left out. They're feeling left behind. They're feeling so frustrated with Washington that they would vote for you know, some, some guy who promises to just blow up the system, even though he clearly has no plan for what comes next. And so I think that the future, solving these challenges of the future of the economy, where the economy is going, what the automated economy means for the future of education, for the future of the workforce, for our competitive position in the globe, I think that's critical for the future of the country. It's critical to help bring Americans together. And it is critical if we are continue, if we're going to continue to be the world leader, if, if China isn't going to take that mantle of leadership away from us. I mean, I'm scared of those things too. But there is a little something a little bit weird. I mean, we're at the lowest unemployment in history and the greatest, you know, surge forward in automation in history too. Is it I mean, it I'm trying to rectify these thoughts in my head. Is automation well, really taking jobs or is it creating jobs while it's taking jobs or is it just moving some jobs from some type of people to other type of people? Is that the problem? What's going on here? Well, here's the problem is that the the top line economic numbers that you you know, accurately shared, don't tell the whole picture. Right. The, the truth of the matter is that uh, there are a lot of Americans who are not on unemployment rolls because they have good jobs, it, sure. But there are also a lot of Americans who are working two or three jobs just to keep, just to make ends meet. Yeah. Uh, there are teachers who are driving Uber or Lyft in the evening just to put bread on the table for their families. And the other group of people are the folks who aren't even on employment, unemployment statistics because they're not even looking for jobs anymore. Mm -hmm. They're addicted to opioids. Uh, or they've just been out of that manufacturing or video games. job or whatever, or whatever it is. Yeah, they're addicted to something. But they might also just have given up because they're depressed, because they've tried for yeah. so hard to replace that great manufacturing job they used to have. And they haven't been able to find a, a job with a good wage. So automation isn't just taking jobs outright. It's changing the workforce really quickly. It's making a lot of jobs pay less. Um, it's uh, it's forcing changes quickly that, that American workers aren't prepared for. And that's why I think it's time for an education revolution. You know, we met the challenge of the Industrial Revolution with a complete education revolution in America. That's when we started Universal High School. That didn't exist before the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. We said, hey, people are coming off the farms um, into the factories, into cities. We need to make sure everyone has a high school degree. Well, now it's time for another education revolution. And Democrats talk a lot about meeting this challenge by giving everybody free college. Look, I think that's a great aspiration. I'm, I'm sitting here in my office in Congress still paying my college loans from Harvard. So I, free college sounds great, but half of America doesn't even go to college. Yeah. One out of four Americans doesn't even graduate from high school right now. We've got to make sure they can succeed in the new economy because that's the income divide. That's the, the political divide represented in this country and in the divisive politics we have here in Washington. Right. It would almost be regressive if everyone was paying taxes, but only the better privileged were receiving the benefits. Free, free college is extremely expensive, and all American taxpayers are going to contribute to it. And yeah, that's right. It's basically just going to go to the elite who already have the opportunity to go to college. So how, how do you break through the noise? Because it, it seems like so many times, like, like public opinion just sways one way and then another way. And like people have these like sound bites and they say things. So like, oh yeah, free college sounds great. People might not be thinking through the issue. How do you actually, I mean, is it possible in, especially in an era where it's all about like sound clips and like who just says the wildest thing last, how do you actually have a, a reasoned explanation of, hey, these things have like real consequences. Maybe we should think it all through. It, it's hard. Honestly, it's hard because sound bites uh, win the day, at least on Twitter or places like that. One of the things I do is I try not to focus on Twitter. I try to do things like this where you actually have a longer forum discussion and you can yeah. get into the details of the issues because we do live in a complicated world. We do live in a world where nuance matters. And uh, if you're just getting all your politics by, by following Twitter or looking at the Fox News headlines, you're not going to see that. Let's talk about energy and climate. That's what our audience is crazy Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Um, and and, they, and rightly pretty, they should be. Yeah. I mean, it's scary. It is. 
we have a huge challenge and uh, we have a huge challenge for the planet, but we also have a huge challenge for America because by many measures right now, China is winning the green tech revolution. We're buying all our solar panels from China. We're buying a yeah. lot of green technologies from China. Uh, I believe that this is the future. I believe that the politicians in America who are holding us back and saying, no, 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 we'll just keep investing in oil and gas. I, I think they're wrong. But it's not just about the planet. It's also about our competitive position vis-a-vis -vis China and other folks around the globe. It's about are these green jobs going to be here for Americans or are we going to be buying all this technology from overseas? I think one of the reasons that um, the oil company or the fossil industry has gotten a bit of a boost is because that is kind of a domestic industry where we've been able to excel. We pump and we sell cheap fossil fuels around Especially the world. in the last 15 years. Right. Yeah. And we're not producing but it's, solar panels. But it's, but it's short term. It's short term. I mean, I don't think that... Uh, I mean, you probably know more scientists than I do, but I don't think anyone's saying, oh, yeah, in 50 years that, you know, fracking is going to be the solution here. So we got to think ahead. And Washington is often not that good at thinking long term. Yeah, but so then how do we align the long term interests with the, the long term global interests with the short term individual interests? It's hard. It's hard. It's something that Washington struggles with a lot. There are technical things we can do. For example, I, I support a bill to just change us from one year budgeting to two year budgeting. Now, that's not a huge change, but literally doubling the horizon at which we make budgetary decisions about how to invest our federal government money would make a difference. Yeah, it's a very in the weeds thing, but when you, uh, you know, I just moved to DC a couple of years ago and I, it's the first time that I met people like worked for the government. And this budget thing is like a real thing. Oh. They can't even think straight. Right. about what programs or how they're going to allocate money because they're all they're always talking about budget. Everyone's just always talking about budget like all year long because it's so short just one year. So uh, is there resistance to changing that? I mean how There how is. Does, There's yeah. amazing level of resistance. And why? To Who's it? pushing back? Against um, it? largely conservatives who, you know, just want the short-term political wins or whatever. Um, you know, the, it's always easier to make short-term decisions. It's always more popular to vote for a tax cut. Um, than to vote for a tax raise to actually make the investments we need for the future. Yeah. Uh, so people can agree like, oh, we should spend more money on education. So one of the funny things about being here in this office is in this office, I have uh, hundreds of groups come to uh, meet me every year and they all want to spend more money on something. You know, there's an education group, there's a healthcare group, uh, you know, people bring in their, their kids who are suffering from life-threatening diseases. I mean, some of this is heartbreaking and you don't sit across from a family that has a child with a rare disease and say, no, I don't think we should put more money into this. Of course we should. We should invest more money in these things, into, into research, into, into education, into all sorts of things. But do you know how many groups have come in and said, Seth, here's a way to raise more revenue to pay for all these things. Mm. You could still be the first because it's exactly zero. The point is that it's hard to make these decisions about making some real sacrifices, paying higher taxes or cutting some of the benefits that we receive right now in order to pay for these new investments. Yeah. Well, I've got your idea for you. Invest in energy technologies and then we sell it around the world and save climate change at the same time. And that's exactly right. And this is why long-term budgeting matters because some of these investments will actually pay off in the long run. Yeah. And Congress made a, a decision to invest in the GI Bill. I wouldn't have gone to grad school without the GI Bill. Think about that. Yeah. And most economists estimate that the GI Bill has given about a seven to one return on investment because those veterans go out, they use their education, they're productive in the economy, they return a lot of that revenue. But one could make the same case about uh, healthcare too. You're, I mean, like your, your citizenry is your workforce, right? We, if we want to run the country like a business, right. these are your employees, you want them to be healthy because then they'll produce more. One could make that argument about healthcare we too. We should be making that argument about healthcare. We should. <laughs> <laughs> so then we got to figure out a way to actually make a compelling argument. We got to fi figure That's out a right. way to actually change people's That's right. Minds. It's hard to explain to people that I know you're going to see your tax bill go up a little bit right now, but in the next five or 10 years, it'll pay off. You know, the economy will be better. This is the big debate with infrastructure right now. Everyone sees the roads and bridges falling apart, but no one wants to raise gas taxes again to pay for it. We haven't raised the gas tax, the federal gas tax, since 1993. Yeah, well, look at what happened in France when they tried to raise a gas tax. I mean, well, they didn't handle it well politically. That was a lack right. of, that was a failure of leadership. Right. But it is the right decision to make for the future. Now, it doesn't mean you, and there's always the, you have to look at the math, right? And you have to see what the return on investment is. You can't raise the gas tax too much. You can't raise any taxes too much. But the right amount of revenue to make the long-term investments we need for the future 
mm -hmm. which save money for Americans in the long run, right? It's like maintenance for your car, right? Take care, do the oil change so you don't have to replace the engine in two years because you never changed the oil. The one thing about climate, though, I mean, this is my number one issue. This is what I've dedicated my life to at but this just point. Just for the record? Yeah. Uh, my wife and I have a Volt, so we, uh, we, I guess technically it's got a, an engine in there, but we almost always go on electric. So that analogy is not good for our family. I'm very proud of the fact that we have a Chevy Volt at home. Yeah, well, I'll push back on this though, because don't be too proud because it depends on where that those electrons come from, right? That's depends absolutely on what you're right. That's absolutely right. So very we got, true. so I mean, so that just speaks that, that it's a complex issue, right? Yes. And, it, and it requires looking at infrastructure from many different perspectives. But coming back to what we were just saying, when it comes to climate, Yes, it's important from a long-term perspective, but when people keep talking about what's going to happen by 2100, I feel like most people just kind of check out. Yeah, I think that the, um, w there's a couple of ways that I've tried to approach the climate issue that are a little bit different. First of all, I talk about the economic impacts in the short term because they may not be the most important thing. I mean, we from a science background may agree that we really got to look at biodiversity and where the planet's temperature will be by 2100, things like that. but we've got to make it real for people. So talking about immediate economic impacts. I live in a coastal community. Fishing is the iconic business of the North Shore of Massachusetts. I mean, it's technically a small percentage of GDP right now, but it's just historically that's been the business. And one group of people who will tell you straight up how fast the ocean is warming are the fishermen. Right. Because they have thermometers on their boats and they see this every single day. And the fish are not just dying, but just leaving. Yeah. I mean, so, so, so Greenland's getting record cod catches, but cod is the iconic fish of Massachusetts and, we've, and, and the cod fish, fisheries are really depleted. So, so the fish are moving with the changing ocean temperatures and that makes a real difference to people at home in Massachusetts. So what you're saying is focus on the short-term impacts that are realized to the common person and use that as a communication tactic to make the whole issue more important. Exactly, and there's another way to do this too and that's to talk about the national security implications of climate change. And this especially rep, uh, resonates with more conservatives who tend to be more concerned about national security. Mm -hmm. And another group of people that will tell you national security, sorry, climate change is a military. serious threat is the military, yeah. Department of Defense. They talk yeah. about this all the time. And you know, energy independence is a, uh, a national security issue too. So can I circle this into nuclear for a second? Sure. We have enough uranium in this country to last the country millions and millions of years on land and billions of years if we pull it from the ocean. How is it that we are not a hundred percent nuclear country from an energy security perspective alone? Why would we import energy? Broken politics. Because nuclear energy has become a political football. Yeah. And there are some legitimate concerns. We can all acknowledge that. Uh, but, but scientists are generally aligned on this, uh, that nuclear is a safe, good investment. It, I mean, no, no energy source is perfectly safe, uh, but, but this is a good investment for the future of our country. But we have to do it responsibly, and that means not just responsibly from a safety and scientific perspective, but from a political perspective as well. Mm -hmm. When it costs billions of dollars in political costs, in legal fees, in lawsuits and everything else just to build a new nuclear power plant because, you know what, because people aren't listening to the science, they're not paying attention to the facts um, because they're scared in ways that they frankly shouldn't be and we should explain that they shouldn't be, uh, then we're not making good decisions. But you know who's, and this drives me crazy, right? Because you know I'm in this for an environmental reason and a lot of it's been the environmental pushback, historically at least, that's either uh, tried to cancel nuclear projects or have driven up costs. Even so, some of the major environmental organizations today aren't on board with nuclear. So I'm it's a, like- I'm a huge environmentalist as well. And this is also why I'm supportive of it. I'm an environmentalist and I'm a scientist. And we on the left, the Democrats, we always use you know, this cudgel of all oh, the, the Republicans don't believe in science, they don't believe in facts. Uh, when they're pushing fossil fuels, when they're uh, denying climate change or whatever else. And then all of a sudden, when it's our issue, a lot of people get away with it. Thank you. Thank you for calling out the hypocrisy there. Because I, I once again, back to, you know, uh, you got to be confident. You got to call people on. People respect you when you call them on their shit, even if they're on your side. 
Not always. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's just, and that's just, look, that's just who I am. Yeah. Um, you know, what, when I talk about, uh, sometimes people ask me, well, Seth, what would you want to be known as, or what would you want to be known for if you're elected president? And the, the most important thing to me is that people trust me. Now, I didn't say that people are always going to agree with me, but people trust me. They know where I stand because I'm never going to agree with everybody. But I want people to know that I tell the truth. And part of telling the truth is having the courage to be honest, even with your allies, with your friends, with uh, the people in your party, um, when they want to ignore science as well for political convenience. So you know, climate change is becoming uh, more salient in politics today. I think, you know, just a couple of years ago, it was like, what, like 20th on the list of people's concerns or something? And it's, now it's in the top few? I mean, it's, it's, it's up there. I want to say one more thing about, about nuclear power, though, which is that I think it is incumbent on people like you and me to, to not just say, okay, this is the science, but to explain to folks you know, why this can be safe. Like for, for example, to explain that you know, there were some reactor designs in the past that weren't entirely safe. But there's a new generation of fission technology coming online today that's available today that doesn't ha that doesn't have those safety risks. But let me let me uh, school you for a second here because one of the things that you know I talked about how actions matter more than words, mm -hmm. and although uh, talking about safety is a word, it's all that's also an action too. And it's like one of those things where like you walk up to someone you've never met before and you're like trust me, trust me, trust me before they get right. to know you. Right. When safety is the first thing that comes out of your mouth, the action of that actually scares people. It's like, whoa, 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 what are we talking about safe? Nobody's talked about safety with a refinery before. Do I have to be some worried about something nuclear here? And that's, I mean, that's one of the things that I felt has held this industry back for so many years. They've relied on safety as their chief selling point for the last 50 years instead of the incredible benefits that come from this technology. And that's what scares people. That's what makes people think, oh, God, I don't know. It's a good point. And the fossil fuel industry gets away with never talking about yeah. this. Just think about, I mean, the statistics are out there. How many Americans die every single year from coal and oil power plants? It's tens of thousands from asthma alone. Yeah. And, and, and that's real. That's not just like, oh, my kid has a sneeze. No, it, it literally is causing American deaths yeah. every single year. How many deaths happened in the last year due to nuclear power? Right. Or ever in America. Ever, period. Right. So th In America. Well, and even, I mean, one but could make... Even if you look glo globally, I mean, that, and that's why I think it's important to acknowledge, okay, we had Fukushima, we have Chernobyl, there are ways we can deal with that. But even if you look worldwide, those numbers of death, that's pale in comparison to what happens every single year from fossil fuels. Though e even saying that you know, we can deal with those, I feel speaks to the wrong argument because no one died at Fukushima, right? Mm -hmm. that, that every nuclear reactor that we have in our country today is a light water reactor that was built essentially like the Fukushima ones in terms of like general characteristics. Right. And when it melted down, three of them melted down and hydrogen gas you know, exploded the radiation all over the place, no one even got hurt. No one got hurt. And so this whole thing, though, like one of the reasons that nuclear is so expensive in this country, it is built on this presupposition that if we had a meltdown, it would be catastrophic. But Fukushima proved that wasn't true. And Chernobyl wasn't even a power reactor. That was a plutonium producing machine for the Soviet empire. So it's like, you know, we've, I think All we also, yeah. and if we, but if we kind of recalibrate the conversation so what do you think, around nuclear. How, how do you do, what does that look like? What does the recalibrated conversation look like? The recalibrated conversation says we acknowledge that our standards for radiation are 10,000 times higher than they should be. Literally, our laws are based on a number 10, a factor of 10,000 off. Meanwhile, Roundup, right? We don't have any right. laws around Roundup, and clearly, as you know, these killing people. killing people. So if we recalibrate radiation, everything will fall into place. Nuclear could become the cheapest energy on planet Earth by a hundredfold. Mm -hmm. And if America takes the leadership for that, we could develop a new six trillion dollar energy export economy. We could secure ourselves with energy independence and we could go zero carbon across the board in a decade. I mean, this is what's possible yeah. if we just recalibrate around nuclear. I agree.
I mean, in, the, in, in, in these are the facts, this is the science. But I'm glad we had this discussion because I'm sitting in a position where I have some influence over how this is this is sort of carried forward in the public discourse. And 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 you're right, like just thinking about that measure of what is dangerous with radiation. I mean, that's um, that's something we should be discussing here in Congress. As we wrap up here, Seth, can you just kind of paint your picture for the future of America, where we could be in just a few years? We could be carbon free and we could be setting that example for the entire world. We could be exporting this technology to China, to Russia, to to Africa, to Europe, to everywhere, so that these are American jobs. They're developing these technologies, selling these technologies, maintaining them around the globe. Uh, this is a massive economic opportunity for us. It's a massive leadership opportunity for us. And it's an incredible opportunity to just do the right thing for the future of our planet, for the future of our kids, so that my seven-month-old daughter can grow up in a much better world. Ladies and gentlemen, the future president of the United States of America, Seth Moulton. Thanks very much. Thank you.